All right. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good evening, good evening, and good evening. As we prepare for our Bible study, I just want to praise the Lord. Say good evening to everybody. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just get right into it. Second Timothy 3.16. I got a lot of uh, things that I want to cover. Not a lot, but I want to cover some things, but I want to make sure. Yeah, we definitely um, give it its due justice, if y'all know what I mean. As you know, we've been having problems since I've been out here uh, in the SIP. We've been having problems with our YouTube um, with the streaming sometimes it cuts off so just decided to um, stream strictly from Facebook and then I'll download it on YouTube uh, later I'll download it on YouTube after uh, finish this Facebook um, just so it some people may wonder why I don't see it on YouTube live right now that's the reason why so 2 Timothy 3.16 is what we always open up with. And I just want to encourage you <clears throat> in reading of the word, meditating on his word day and night. But letting his word have the authority in our life. I want to encourage you as this Bible study and all this is that we may learn more of him. Because we declare or we are giving him all authority. That his word may be all authority. His word is over my word. His word is over our opinions. His word is over our understanding. His word is supreme, meaning that it has all authority. So I just want to encourage you when we read the word, don't take it as this is just another something we're doing. No, this is God allowing us to get to know him. This is God breathing fresh breath in us us taking up on his breath because the bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration or is god bread and is profitable for doctrine for reproof correction and instruction in righteousness so that every man of god may be equipped thoroughly equipped for all good works and this is our prayer that we are thoroughly equipped for all good works in the name of jesus amen amen and amen So as we pick back up in the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers, I want us to really focus on some things. I want us to focus on some things in regards to Numbers today. I want us to focus on the zealous of God's kingdom. I want, as I was reading and studying this evening, recapping the lesson, <coughs> excuse me, all I could think about is the zealous for God. How zealous are we? You know, how uh, inspired are we to live for God? How zealous are we when it comes to being bold about the gospel man i just got a thing and said it's really choppy man i don't know what it is on my end it says clear on my end it says nothing and i'm just upset about this that is really choppy i'm really upset about this because last sunday the same thing as with the Sunday service, but the the time before that it was not, but this time saying it's really choppy. No, I'm not a, I'm not excited about that. Okay, here we go. They said it's fine here on okay. Thank you, thank you, Bet. Said it's fine on the regular Facebook page, my Facebook page, so if you can tune in there. I don't know why. Uh, it's choppy 
on one and not the other. But I want to dive into this. This is Numbers chapter 24. And we'll do a little small recap of Numbers chapter 24. Thank you for that. I want us to really look at and ask ourselves, how zealous are we when it comes to God's word? How zealous are we when it comes to God? And when I talk about zealous, I'm not talking about the way we lift our hands. I'm not talking about how many times you go to church. I'm not talking about how often you always say praise God or how you always uh, say something in regards to people seeing that you're blessed and highly favored or you use these uh, these words or these sayings to somehow show you're zealous. No, what I mean by zealous and what the Bible says when God speaks about zealous is that you are consumed with the Lord. He becomes your all, your everything. I think Psalm 33 says, stand in awe of the wonder, wonders of God. And that's what God is saying, that you're always in this place that you're in awe of him. Meaning that you yearn to satisfy or glorify him. It's like a child when it comes to their parents. They look to do things in order to please their parents. And I'm saying, do we have that attitude when it comes to God? And I want us to really ask ourselves that question. Because when we ask ourselves that question, then the next question should be, then why are you struggling with obedience? Why are you procrastination? Why are you, why are you idle? See, when you have a zeal for God, it fights against being idle in him or procrastinating in him. You just want to obey him. You don't want to lean on your own understanding. You don't want to stay in a place that's outside of him. Why? Because of your zeal for him. Now, I want us to get that mentality or get that mind state when it comes to God. But I want us to ask ourselves that where are we when it comes to the zeal for God's word, when it comes to the zeal for God's presence, when it comes to the zeal of pleasing whom we call Savior and Lord. Numbers chapter 24. Remember Balaam, the prophet that is wayward. Has been asked by Balaam to build all types of false idols or false altars to the false god Baal in Numbers chapter 24 he says since Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel he did not go and seek omens as on previous occasions but he turned toward the wilderness when Balaam looked up and saw Israel and camp tribe by tribe the spirit of God came on him and he proclaimed his poem so now Balaam, remember, he's doing a proclamation or decoration. God is using him to speak against the pagan king. And he's saying, how can he speak against God? He cannot. God is using him to speak what God is saying. And what's amazing of this is that God says that Balaam didn't, seek omens at this time as he previously did so God is showing you that you have a prophet who who plays and dibbles and dabbles in things that is not of God you have a prophet that is lukewarm you have a prophet that dibbles and dabbles in things that's outside of God it's like a Christian uh who believes in the Lord but yet they play around with um what's the what's the word uh you know, horoscopes. So, yeah, you believe in the Lord, but you still seek horoscopes. You still seek these omens. Remember, horoscopes is a omen type sorcery that they are saying that this is a type of a day you will have. They are proclaiming to do things that is not of the Lord. Man. So, I'm, I'm texting. I'm, I 
if you're having issues on the DC How Facebook page, log on to my uh, personal Facebook page, and they said it's better there. They said it's better there on my personal Facebook page. So if you're having issues, uh, please log on to my personal Facebook page. They said it's better. I see that um, we're having some issues with those who logged on to uh, the DC How page. So when I'm looking at this, right, when I'm looking at Balaam, he's dibbling, dabbling in those things. This is why God is really showing us some things because we have somebody who's called in God, but yet they're still dibbling, dabbling in things that is not of God. So now God says and points us out and really shows us about Balaam. <clears throat> but then God has Balaam and uses Balaam, even though he's in his wayward state, God still uses him. And we really need to take heed to that because God uses whom he will use. God can still use people in a wayward state. That doesn't mean they are in God. That just shows that God is in control. I want us to understand that because sometimes we get deceived by we see uh, healings or different things manifest from people. And therefore, we put that title on them that they have to be from God. That's not true. Balaam is being used by God, but he's not of God. That's why in a book of Matthew chapter seven, God said they prophesied in my name. They went out and did all these things in my name. But he said their hearts were far away from me. And when they called him Lord, Lord, he said, you're not you're not with me. He said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. But yet we see that they were doing works of the Lord. But yet God said, you're not with me. Because you can be used to do the work of the Lord, but that does not mean you're with the Lord. That's why we have to be cautious of some of these people on here that claim to be prophets. And they speak these things and they may do things, but that doesn't mean they are of God. You have to be careful of that. You have to be really cautious of that. We have to be discerning of these people because some people will come in the name of the Lord, but that doesn't mean they're from the Lord. So when God is speaking of this, God is speaking in this manner. God is communicating this, showing us this prophet. And then the Bible says he starts prophesying to Balak and he starts prophesying to Balak about God, about future things. And he prophesies about Jesus. Notice in verse 17 of chapter 24, he says, a star will come from Jacob and a scepter will arise from Israel. And he's speaking in these terms that God is using this wayward prophet to speak things prophetically to a pagan king. God is showing that he's in control. And this is why we as believers should always put our hope and trust in God that I don't care what you come up against. I don't care how pagan they are, how worldly they are. God can still use them to bless you. God can still use him. Use them in order to bless you. They can't stop what God is doing in you and through you. If God says this is a door for you, guess what? I don't care what they do or what they say. If God says it's a door for you, they can't stop it. And we must put our trust in Lord, in the Lord. And God is showing here that he can use somebody who's in the world or not, or not of the world. He can use a person who's a Christian and non-Christian alike. God can use them. That's why we put our faith in him and we should not get weary when we see things or see people in places that do not like us, that are that we think are against us. They It doesn't matter what they are against or if they are against me. If God is for me, then what can man do against me? It doesn't matter. That's why we shouldn't get caught up in what people do or don't do. We should get caught up in the God in whom we serve. And God has shown us that he's using a pagan prophet, a wayward prophet to bring forth his will. And God says in verse 17 that he's prophesying about this scepter and this scepter is the coming of Jesus Christ. It's a prophetic word. It's a prophetic utterance. Let me show you all a couple of things. Psalm 40, Psalm 45, 6, Psalm 45, 6. 
We got to be taught this thing. We teaching. This is Bible study. We teaching this thing. The word skeptor, when you see that word in the Bible, it means uh, a rule. So remember in the book of Psalms, I think around Psalm 23, when the Bible says, thy rod and thy staff, that is like a skeptor. It's a, it's a uh, tool that the king uses to show his dominion. So when the Bible says a skeptor, it's something that this king or somebody in authority is using to show their domain, their rule. So when the Bible speaks of skeptor, it, it correlates it to rule. So in Psalm 45, 6, the Bible says... Your sharpened arrows pierce the hearts of king's enemies. The people will fall under you. Your throne, God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of justice. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of joy more than your companions. So you see here that God is saying... In the book of Numbers, chapter 24, when he speaks about this coming scepter, he's speaking about a correlation in Psalm 45, 6, about the one whose scepter is to rule forever. Let me show you a couple other scriptures. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And I'm trying to take my time. I'm going to go over a couple of scriptures. But I want us to really, so cross-reference this in your Bible. Because I want us to really grab hold of this. As I'm going over these scriptures. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 8. Says this. I'm going to say. I'm going to start in verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Or again I will be his father. And he will be my son. Again when he brings his firstborn into the world. He says. And let all God's angels worship him. And about the angels he says. He makes his angels winds. But his servants a fiery flame. But to the son. Watch this. Verse 8. That's when people say that Jesus is not God. This is another scripture you can go to. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. Notice when he says. But to the son. Watch what he says about the son. Your throne, O God. That's a clear reference to the son being God. Look at that. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. Highlight that in your Bible. But to the son, your throne, O God. He's calling the son God. Is forever and after, ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy beyond your companions. Where do we get that cross reference from? Psalm 45, 6. And the same thing with Numbers chapter 24. God is speaking about a coming scepter. What is that scepter? That's the coming of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. And so God uses a wayward prophet to prophesy of the coming of the Messiah, which is Jesus Christ. And we see this. And this is why, let me go one more scripture. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 5. Let me go to that scripture real quick to show you that correlation of scepter. This is Isaiah chapter 45, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 6. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God but me. I will strengthen you, though you do not know me. So that all may know that the rising of the sun to the setting, that there is no God, no one but me. I am the Lord and, the, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. And I make success and create disaster. I'm the Lord who does all these things. I'm sorry, it's not Isaiah 45, 6. It's Isaiah 14. I'm like, that ain't right. Isaiah 14, 6. But that's a good scripture in 45. That's a good scripture. So Isaiah 14, 6 says, When the Lord gives you rest from your pain, torment, and hard labor, you are forced to do. You will sing this song of contempt about the king of Babylon and say, how the oppressor has quieted down and how the raging has become quiet. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. So you see here again that God says he's broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. So you see here, and when it talks about scepter, it's talking about a domain of the rulers. It's talking about what they rule. And God is saying that he's breaking the scepter of the ones of wickedness. And this 
Numbers chapter 25 is the scepter that he's putting in place of the coming Messiah. And here we see in the Old Testament that the Lord is prophesying about Jesus. So we see Jesus in the Old Testament. So the Bible continues to allow Balaam to prophesy about the coming Messiah. But let's let's move ahead. So Balaam went away, verse 25. So now in chapters 25, we see while Israel was staying in Achaia grove, the people began to prostitute themselves with the woman of Moab. The women invited them to sacrifices for their gods and the people ate and bowed down uh, and worshiped to their gods. So Israel aligned itself with Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord. So his burning anger may turn away from Israel. Notice here. When we're looking at this and reading uh, in reference to Numbers chapter 25, this is amazing here. You see that after God deals with Balaam, he shifts back in Numbers chapter 25 and the Israelites began to prostitute themselves with the women of Moab. And what's amazing here, remember, they just went through The snake incident with Moses. When they went up against Moses, remember, and God uh, put the plague and God had to put, had Moses put the snake on a staff. And they had just went through all of this. Remember, they just went through everything, uh, just doing things against God. And so we see here in Numbers chapter 25, we see the continuation of the issues within God's people. Now we see them given over to sexual immorality. They're prostituting themselves outside of God's covenant. They're prostituting themselves outside of what God had them uh, to commune with each other. Remember, they were not supposed to go outside of the nation of Israel. They were supposed to stay within the covenant. They weren't supposed to be unevenly yoked with others outside of the belief in the Lord Yahweh. But here we see that the people began to prostitute themselves with the women of Moab. And then as they began to prostitute themselves, the women invited them to sacrifice to their gods. And the people aligned themselves with them with their gods. So look at this. They start to sleep with the women and then they start to serve the women's gods. Just think about this for a second. They had they they just saw the goodness of God. They had been seeing this over and over. So now as they get connected with these women, they start prostituting themselves to that their pagan gods. This is why the scripture says in the New Testament, bad company corrupts good character. This is why the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, do not be unevenly yoked. Why does God say that? Because the yoking, the yoking of, the yoking of those who outside of God can sway us to serve their gods. I was just in my class today, they were talking about uh, how we can be swayed by the group that we uh, reside in, the company we keep. And they said and gave this uh, quote or saying and said that we are the average of the five people that we closely intertwine ourselves with. If you take five of our closest people that we intertwine or connect ourselves with, we are the average of those people. And I thought that was interesting because they said you're an average of the people that you mostly connect yourself with. And the Israelites here are connecting themselves with these women. And they take on what the women take on. Why? Because that's whom they connected themselves with. Do y'all see that connection? This is why God warns us about the company we keep. This is why God warns us about whom we connect ourselves with. But notice, watch this though. The people started to connect themselves with these women. 
And this is what I want us to really, I want us to really take heed to. I want us to ask ourselves these questions. Where in the world did these women come from? That's the question I want us to ask ourselves because it seems in Numbers chapter 25, we've never seen the Israelites connect themselves with pagan women. But now we see the Israelites connecting themselves with pagan women. Where did they get this? Because now we see them prostitute themselves to the Baal of Peor. And this is the first time that we start seeing Baal, this God Baal, upon the scene. In Numbers chapter 24, Balak tells Balaam to sacrifice um, on altars of Baal. And this is the first time where we start seeing Baal introduced. But Baal is not introduced to the people of God yet. Balaam is familiar with him. Balak is familiar with Baal. Why? Because they served pagan gods. They served pagan gods. So they were familiar with Baal. But we haven't seen Baal introduced to God's people. So let me, I'm going I'm to give us this, this thought that I have. Of where I believe that the women came from. When you look at the women here. I'm going to skip ahead to some scriptures. The women came uh, and the idea of the women coming to engage with the uh, children of Israel wasn't by coincidence. I want us to understand that. It was strategic. This is why we have to be careful about the people we connect ourselves with because the enemy can send people to get us off track. Your connection with a person can be the very reason why you start being wayward. And these things are strategic. They're not by accident. You wonder why sometimes that... <laughs> You know, um, you told God that you're going to honor God with your body. You're going to honor him. You're going to wait for God. You don't think the enemy will send you people that God didn't send? Yes, he will. Because he understands something. Let me show you what he understands. Let me, let me get more in depth in this. Numbers chapter 31. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. I'm going to show you where they came from. I'm going I'm to I'm skip ahead because I think this is important. Numbers chapter 31, verse 6. <clears throat> In Numbers chapter 31, we'll get there eventually, but I want to skip ahead because it makes a point here. God is speaking about a recap of some of the things that happened with God's people. But look at Numbers chapter 31, verse 6. Moses sent 1,000 from each tribe to war. They went with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, and, and those whom were the holy object and signal and, and object and signal trumpets. They waged war against Midian as the Lord had commanded Moses and killed every male. Along with the others slain by them, they killed the Midian kings, Evi, Rincom, Zor, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. The Israelites took the Midianite women and their dependents captive and they plundered all the property. Hold up. Hold up. Am I right? Hold on. Hold on. Am I right? I will switch it on right. Thirty-one. Hold on. I'm sorry. Okay, that's why I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop right there. So here, there we go. I'm sorry. It's in Numbers. Why well, I put six? It's number sixteen. So I'm gonna keep reading. 
The Israelites took the Midianite women and their dependents captive, and they plundered all their cattle, flocks, and property. Then they burned all the cities where the Midianites lived, and as well as their encampments, they took away all the spoils of war and captives, both people and animals. They brought the prisoners, animals, and spoils of war to Moses. The priest Eleazar and the Israelite community at the camp of the plains of Moab by the Jordan across the Jer from Jericho. Moses, the priest Eleazar, and all the leaders of the community went to meet them outside the camp. But Moses became furious with the officers, the commanders of the thousands and commanders of hundreds, who were returning from the military campaign. Have you let every female live? He asked them. Yet they, they are the ones who, at Balaam's advice, incited the Israelites to unfaithfulness against the Lord in pure incident, so that the plague came against the Lord's community. So here, let me give a recap. Moses here, and God is giving a recap of what happened in Numbers chapter 24. I mean, Numbers chapter 25. God is going more in depth about Numbers chapter 25 and Numbers chapter 31. But I want us to pay attention in verse 16 of Numbers chapter 31. Moses asked them, did they kill all the women that the Israelites had connected with? But notice that he also says and gives us insight in verse 16. He says, Yet those are the ones whom Balaam gave advice. He incited the Israelites to unfaithfulness against the Lord, against the Lord and Pierre. So the Bible says in Numbers chapter 25, the pagan women and why they came and connected themselves with the, to the Israelites was due to Balaam's advice or counsel. Balaam gave counsel to Balak how to incite the Israelites. How are you going to incite them? He said to the Moabite women, sexual immorality. Balaam used his gift to come up another way in order to get God's people. I want us to really grab hold of that. Remember, Balaam told Balak that he could not curse. He could not curse them. He could not curse what God has blessed. Remember, he said that. Let me turn to another scripture. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Man, follow, man. That's some good stuff. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. This is God writing to the uh, angel of the church of Pergamum. Pergamum. Though, thus says the Lord who has sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who is put to death among you, where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. God is speaking against the church. And remember in book of Revelations, God is speaking to the seven churches. And that seven churches represents all of God's people. It represents the whole church. Seven was a number of completion. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. God says some people in the church hold to the teaching of Balaam. What was that? Who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites. To eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Wow. God said in Revelation chapter 2 and Numbers chapter 31 that it was Balaam's idea of the women of Midian. It was his idea to put a stumbling block in front of God's people in order that they would fall. He taught this to Balak. He gave Balak insight of how to get God's people. So let me tell you, man, this is, this is good. So make sure you're writing this down, connecting to your, uh, the verses in the Bible. But this is what I want us to really grab hold to. And this is what I'm saying about Balaam. Remember in second Peter chapter two, verse 15. Yep. Second Peter chapter two, verse 15. And I'm trying to take my time. So we got 
Numbers chapter 31, verse 16, where God says Balaam gave advice to. And then we see Revelation chapter 2, right? Verse 6. I mean, verse 14, but read all the way from 6 to 14, where God's speaking to the church. God says that Balaam gave counsel to Balak and taught him how to have the Israelites stumble. And he introduced and said sexual immorality is key. Oh my goodness. Man, faith, 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 go to um man, faith, go to my personal Facebook page. They say there's not freezing there. Faith, go to my personal Facebook page. And he he in Revelation chapter two, God is showing uh God is showing where the women came from. God is showing where the women came from. So this is key. Second Peter chapter two, verse 15. God says they have full, they have eyes full of adultery that never stop looking for sin. They seduce unstable women and have hearts trained in greed. Children under a curse. They have gone astray by abandoning the straight path and have followed the path of Balaam, the son of Azor, who loved the wages of wickedness. Who loved the wages of wickedness. And God gives a correlation and said their eyes were full of adultery. They never stopped looking for sin. So God correlates this with Balaam. So in other words, God has given us hints that Balaam never gave up because his heart was full of greed. Let me show you. I'm going to connect all of this so I can bring it all together. Remember in Numbers chapter 24, I pointed this verse out last week, but I'm going to bring it back this week. Remember in Numbers chapter 24, verse 10, Balak became furious with Balaam, struck his hands together, and said to him, I summon you to put a curse on my enemies, but instead you have blessed them three times. Now go to your home. I said I reward you richly, but look, the Lord has denied your reward. God has denied your reward. I want y'all to pay attention to that. Remember when Balak told Balaam that God has denied your reward. And he said, go to your ward. You could have been blessed richly. Remember, even number chapter 23, he told him that you could be blessed richly. Remember, he, he continued on and on and on about how he could bless Balaam if he would compromise his walk with the Lord. If he would compromise obedience. And he tempted him by riches. He tempted him by wealth. He attempted him by his desires. I would give you all of your desires if you would do this. And what I what I believe happened is, in my spiritual mind, this is what I believe happened. Notice that God had told in Numbers chapter 24, verse 25, the Bible said, Balaam then arose and went back to his homeland and Balak also went to his, his way. I believe on the way home, Balaam, on the way home, that it really was upon his mind and how the enemy played with his mind about all the riches he was going to miss. He thought about everything that Balak had promised him. And he thought about how he was going to miss out on all these riches. And I believe during this time on his way home, he started to think about, well, you know what? God won't allow me to curse them. I can't do that. Remember, he told Balak, I can't only speak what the Lord wants me to speak. 
So what he did was he conjured up in his mind another way to get God's people. Well, how then? How did he decide that? How did he see that this was a way to get God's people? The reason why I believe he saw this is because he knew God emphasized holiness. He understood that the God of Abraham emphasized holiness. Remember, they understood the sacrificial system. And in a sacrificial system, it had to be an unblemished animal. So he understood holiness. So then he, he said, you know what? I cannot curse them. But what I can do is tip them to engage in unholiness. How do I get that? How do I get them to do that? Because he thought about this and then he went back to Balak and he said, Balak, you know what? I can't curse them, but you know what? I, I think I, I have another way that can help you. I think I got another way that we could separate them from the God of holiness. All we have to do is make them unholy. Because the God of holiness, he doesn't like unholy. He doesn't like things that are unholy. So then he said, Balak, I got a way that I can get them. And if I give you this strategy, then give me those riches. And this is what he conjured up in his mind. I'm not, I can't do that in the Lord. God won't allow me, but I'll do something else. And this is how we, this is, this is how we sometimes do. We rationalize wickedness. It's not that, but this one will be okay. And this is what Balaam did. God is showing us Balaam's zeal wasn't for the God. His zeal was for the wealth, the greed that was inside was within his heart. He didn't have a zealous for God's holiness. He had a zeal for the riches of the world. He wasn't storing up the riches in heaven. He was storing up for riches on earth. And the enemy used that. And he came with an idea that would still allow him to not miss out on that wealth of the world. And he gave the counsel to Balak. Mm -hmm. Because he understood holiness. He understood. The seduction of women. He understood that. You could send them in. And they could be used to seduce or inflare or capture God's people. And they would be seduced to where they start worshiping an idol God. Hence, making them unholy. And in that state, they could not rise up against Balak. Balaam had insight. Balaam had the gift. He was very insightful. He could see things. He understood how deception worked. He understood how persuasion worked. That's why some people have gifts of persuasion. And they're able to seduce people by their words. They're able to seduce things because they recognize actions. They recognize uh, movements. They recognize uh, the state of people. And they can take advantage of states. And they know what to do in order to draw. 
because Balaam had the gift of persuasion. But yet we see in that understanding he did not utilize that gift for the zealous, for the zeal of the Lord. So he used that in order to entrap or encamp God's people to false idolatry because he understood holiness when it comes to God. And he wanted those riches and he found a way that he could somehow please God and get what he wanted. Do you see what I'm saying? He figured out and conjured in his mind how he could still please God, but yet at the same time get what he wanted. Divided heart. Because his intentions was not fully with God. That's why God emphasized it was him who made Balaam speak. It wasn't Balaam. The good that Balaam did, it was from God, not Balaam. God is showing you what was really in Balaam's heart. So I wonder, oh man, that's just, man, that's beautiful. So then the Bible says, the Lord said, execute them all in broad daylight. And remember, this is the same place. Let me go up in verse two. The Baal of Peor. Remember, this is the same place that Balaam was asked by Balak to go and make altars. Numbers chapter 24. Um, Balak asked Balaam to build an altar on Peor, on the mountain of Peor. Now, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 23, verse 27. Again, Balak said to Balaam, please come, I will take you to another place. Maybe it will be agreeable to God that you can put a curse on them from me there. So Balaam took Balaam to the top of Peor, which overlooks the wasteland. So this Peor was a place where Baal worship was established. So notice that God said in verse 20, I mean, Numbers chapter 25, that Israel aligned itself with the Baal of Peor. And Peor was a place where, of that pagan worship was already being entertained. So the women came from that place where Baal had already been uh already been established in that region, in that area. And there they were used to seduce God's people. And in that they start following pagan gods. And following pagan gods, the Bible says that God anger raged. So Balaam had an understanding of this. He had an understanding that I can utilize the seduction of women to draw the men. Therefore, to poison the camp. Because these men were tribal leaders. And remember, we learned in a, earlier in the book of Numbers that God's tribal leaders were the ones who held up the flags and they were stood in reference to the tribe that they uh, were in uh, leading. They had a lot of influence. So if you grab the leader, then guess what? You influence the people. Because the leaders are showing this is a practice and this is why it's so pertinent because what type of message were they giving the tribes? Man, Balaam understood this. So the Bible says, the Lord said, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight. God had to show that this was serious offense and the leaders had to be made example in broad daylight. Verse 5 says, So Moses told Israel, Judges, kill each of the men who aligned themselves with Baal of Peor. Men, kill all of them. Because, look at what that spoke to the tribes. As a matter of fact, let's go even further. And an Israelite man came bringing a Midian, this is verse 6, woman to his relatives in the sight of Moses and the whole Israelite community while they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. 
So not only, not only were they being seduced or following the uh, idolatry of this false god Baal, the Bible says in verse 6 that this Israelite man brought this woman to the entrance of the tent. While they were weeping at the entrance, this Israelite man had the audacity to bring the woman in front of the tent. Do you see? I want us to really see and grab hold of how we can become complacent in God and to where we, we start doing things as if God is pleased or accepting of that. Look at this. We can start bringing the person we're shacking up with at the altar. No, to church, but never come to a place of repentance. As if that lifestyle is okay with God. We can come to God's presence with unforgiveness in our heart and think God is okay with that. Come to God. Know we're in a wayward place. But yet come with our waywardness and never feel the urge to repent of it. Like we feel like that's okay. I want us to really see this. And sometimes it's evidence because we have yoked ourselves with things that are not of God. And the reason why we approach God like that in that manner is because of the things we've been yoked with. So therefore, we think we can come to God any kind of way and we can come to him any type of way with any type of thing and not have any zeal for the house of the Lord to even repent of those things that we're weightily involved in. We bring the sin to God as if he's okay with it. If he's okay with us to stay in that place. If he's okay with me to stay in this waywardness. If he's okay with me to stay in this mentality or this idea. But yet we say we have a zeal for the Lord. Somehow we mixed up the thing. Zeal is just by us raising our hands and praise. But yet the zeal is we can come to his presence and recognize where we where he's shown us where we fall short and we give it to him so that he can his grace can fill the gap. His grace can allow his grace can be introduced in our life to do something about places and areas where we fall short. But yet somehow we come to this place to think it's okay to bring old girl to the tent as if it's God is cool with that. Because remember, and I'm going to stop right there. I'm not going to go any further in this scripture. I'm going to stop right there. But remember, when we read earlier about the entrance of the tent. Remember, this is where God's presence dwelled. Remember, at the entrance of the tent is where they would wait to hear from God. Remember the smoke would come down or the cloud would come over the tent and they wait at the entrance to hear from God. So this is a place that was known to reverence God. But somehow in here, this Israelite man in the place where they reverence God, where his presence is, he's bringing. He's bringing. Look at this. A, the Midianite woman who introduced him to pagan practices and he brought her to the presence of the Lord as if it's okay. As if he's beca become accepted of this lifestyle. As if this is okay with God. I'm just trying to show us that somewhere in there it's easy for us to lose the zeal for God. 
that we become we become we come to a place where we think we can approach him any type of way. We think that the things that God has blessed, we can treat it any kind of way. I'm saying we can get married and we get married before God, but then in the marriage, we don't want to honor him. We act any kind of way. We don't we don't honor God as a wife. We don't honor God as being a husband. We think we can do anything when it comes to God now. Where's the zeal for the house? The house would be, we bring in pagan things to the house and this is okay. Mentalities. As if God is pleased with that. And we bring that to his presence with no, with no reverence to repent of it. That God would help us to, us to be delivered from it. We hold on to grudges. We hold on to ideologies. We stay in these places of waywardness. As if God is okay with this. As if God is okay with us being intertwined with horoscopes. As if God is okay with us practicing these things that are not of him. As God is okay with us staying in the desires that are not of him. As it's okay to be uh, these things or the desires that we know are not of him, it's okay to be that in him. I heard someone say, I'm a gay Christian. What? Those two words are against each other. That's a contradiction. That's the same thing that he's doing here. That's like somebody said, uh, half Christian, half thug, or half hustle, or something. I've read some shirts that said that. What? How can you be half of half? That's lukewarm. And somewhere we get these mind states that we can come to God any kind of way and be still of our old self and our new self and be okay with that life. No, God, I'm not okay with my old self. And I'm trying to be delivered of those things as you reveal them to me. As I bring it in the house, I don't want to leave with it. Because of my zeal for your house. All I'm saying, I'm done. Where are we at with the zeal? They weeping at the entrance of the tent. And he bring old Susie Q like it's okay. He bring her like God's okay with that. Like God is okay with him bringing old, old uh, Tabitha. Tabitha in her old pagan ways. Like God is okay with you just practicing all those to bail and then you come and serve me too. Not only that, you bring the person who helped you Move away from me. And you bring her as if I'm okay with that. Like I'm okay with that lifestyle. It's one thing to struggle with something, but yet allowing God to deliver me and clean me. It's another thing to accept it as this is just me. As two different things. Sounds a lot like Balaam. Balaam wanted God. And at the same time, he wanted to serve the omens, the riches and the greed. And God said, you can't serve two masters. When you have a zeal for the house of the Lord, you can't serve two masters. So I asked that question. I'm done. I'm done. Where's the zeal for the house of the Lord? Where's the zeal when God and things God is calling you to? As we learn today in the Bible study today, look at the zeal. God said, man, this thing has to be exposed. Because they start practicing idolatry. Look at the example they were setting. Look at what their lives were witnessing. You said he's Lord, but yet your witness does not reflect that he's Lord. Your zeal is not fully for his house. You can't have some of God 
part of God, half of God. No, God says all. But yet, where's the zeal? Where's the zeal? Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Father, we just pray, Lord, for our study tonight, God, to show us areas in our life, God, that, Lord, we're not, we're not zealous for your house. The areas, oh God, we may be still intertwined and doing things. Help us not to be content with sin. Help us not be content with the things that are against you. Lifestyles, mentalities, understandings. Help us, oh God, not to be the ones, oh God, that continue to stay in that place. Lord, help us, Lord, even to be aware of the people that the enemy bring us. Yes, Lord, to somehow seduce us, move us away from God instead of to God. Help us, Lord, not to get caught up in greed and all these things, oh God, that we try to find other ways to somehow still fit in with the world. No, Lord, the world and the flesh and the spirit are enmity with each other. Help us to try, try to mesh these things together. No, Lord. Father, help us to be more zealous for your house, more zealous for your ways, and all of our understanding and all of our being. Father, help us, O oh God. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I'm saying, where's your zeal? Where's your zeal? Where's your zeal? Where's your zeal? In all your marriage, where's your zeal when it comes to God? In everything you do, where's your zeal? Where's your zeal? Unevenly yoked. You got to watch. Hey, look at this. I'm saying that. You got to watch. You got to watch it. You got to watch who you go to lunch with. I'm done, man. Y'all know I can go on and on. You got to watch who you go to lunch with. You got to watch. The people that we sometimes connect with, we call friends. They were friends of the old you. That don't mean they're the friends of the new you. You got to watch because the enemy can use them to somehow take you away from the new you. Come on. God bless you all. I'm just saying the enemy is against your marriage. The enemy is against your life and they'll use whomever and whatever. Let our zeal be for the house of the Lord. God bless you all.